Being a Christian doesn't mean it's gonna be happy all the time, it's gonna be easy all the time. We wanted to have a family and we couldn't get pregnant. And we couldn't get pregnant. And we kept trying and we couldn't get pregnant. And so we decided to do foster care. The thing I wanted more than anything in the world to be a mama is also the thing that has caused more pain but also has drove me to Jesus like nothing else. I was at work one afternoon, got a call for two little boys. We fostered for three years before our adoptions were final. And we thought the battle was won. And what we didn't know was the battle was just beginning. But learning to trust that His ways are not our ways and learning through parenting that I am in control of nothing. I have to trust that God's plan is better. Even if the situation is not good, he is always good, and you can trust Him. Hi, my name is Robin, and I'm really uh, happy to be able to talk to you tonight about my salvation experience, um, but more than that, my experience with walking with Jesus. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents, I don't remember a time before they got saved. So it was all about church. We went to church. We went to revival meetings and um, recently went to visit my dad in, in Tennessee a year or so ago. And there was a big old tent set up um, in one of the little towns outside where he lives. And it brought back floods of memories of just tent revivals and going night after night after night after night. After night, after night, after night. It was just how we grew up. We did small groups before small groups were a thing. My parents, we would leave church and go to someone's house. They'd give us a bologna sandwich and some Lay's potato chips and some Kool-Aid and send us off to play because that was when kids were to be seen and not heard. And then we would hear our parents in the living room reading the Bible and praying and just talking about what God was doing in their lives. So I'm very thankful for that foundation However, that foundation was rocked when my perfect family with my perfect church and my perfect childhood fell apart and my dad and my mom got a divorce. And my mom and brother, sister, and I ended up five, six hours away in Roanoke, Virginia. And we really knew no one. But even the journey of getting to where we lived was uh, just God providing for my mom with a job and an apartment and a church that just kind of took us in and loved us. And we were the only divorced kids in the Christian school that I went to at the time. So we were kind of an anomaly. I was fortunate enough to go to a Christian school. And again, that foundation was there. So I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I knew that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And there was one way of of being saved, and that was through the blood of Jesus. And I made that decision when I was in sixth grade. Um, I didn't have a lot of sordid past. Um, you know, all of our testimonies are different. And um, I was, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home. So there wasn't a lot of saving from situations. And I'm thankful for that. But what my testimony is mostly about is learning that being a Christian doesn't mean it's going to be happy all the time. It's going to be easy all the time. Um most of my testimony includes some really hard things and learning that, according to Daniel 3.18, that and if not, he is still good and he is faithful. Like I said, I went to Christian school, graduated from a Christian school, had a full-ride scholarship to Liberty University, but uh, got to Liberty campus and I was depressed. I didn't know it. Um, I'd had some things happen in, just in my high school years that— had caused some depression, but I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what it was called. And when the nurse at Liberty Clinic told me, I thought she was lying, and it made me mad. So I decided I was going to leave school and go live with my dad in Tennessee. And on the way to Tennessee, I decided I needed some money. So after December, left college in December, came home, went to work. And um, just a few months later, I was married. My husband was my boss. We dated for three weeks. We got engaged and was married three months later. So I never made it to Tennessee. Even that is a story of God's provision because even though I was raised in the the Christian foundation that says don't be unequally yoked, I married a man who at that time was not a believer. 
And so that brought some challenges. Um, he wanted me and my lifestyle. However, after we were married, he didn't want to do the work. He didn't want to go to church. He didn't want to be involved. And so that led to, to some hard times. And when I realized that God said, you know, by your conduct, you will win them. Speaking of an unsafe spouse, I knew that I had to be who God had called me to be, even if that was going to cause friction in my marriage. And it did for a while. But then again, God is faithful. And my husband um, was saved, and our life together as a married Christian couple began. Still, that thought from early on, though, that if you love Jesus, things are happy, things are perfect, things are easy, um, that was still following me. I hadn't yet unpacked those untruths um, of what being a Christian really is. And those situations came and God taught me a lot through those situations. The first situation was um, we wanted to have a family. From a little girl, all I cared about was being a mama. I didn't care about careers, had no desire to go to work. I just wanted to be a wife and a mama and bake cookies and do the PTA and volunteer at church. And I had this whole perfect little life mapped out in my head of what, what that was going to be. And we couldn't get pregnant. And we couldn't get pregnant, and we kept trying, and we couldn't get pregnant. And so we decided to do foster care because that was what we were told was the best way of getting to adoption. Um, so we became foster parents. Um, and I will tell you that if it is not God's time and God's will, foster parenting is not the way to, to build a family. Um, and it truly is a calling, and it's a calling in God's time. So um, we continued our infertility journey, um, and we had two little boys that were placed with us, and it did not go well. And I was being treated at the time for seizures and epilepsy, and they were not adapting well. And then at that time, it was before they uh, included foster parents and plans and treatments and histories. And so we knew nothing of what our kids were going through at the time. And so we made the decision that um, we couldn't continue to be foster parents. And with great sorrow on the day before Thanksgiving, they left. And my husband and I looked at each other and said, never again. Hurts too bad. Never again. And we continued with our infertility journey. And through that journey, God taught me several things. And one is, there's a verse in Mark, Mark 9, where a dad is asking Jesus to his son. And he says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's the first time in my life I really started praying and thanking God for what he was going to do even before he did it. Um, and he is faithful. And eight years into our infertility journey, I got pregnant with my son, Shane, who is... Um, the biggest blessing that God had brought into our life. And we're so thankful for him and just all the joy that he brought. Several years later, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And through that journey, God taught me that while I thought following rules, following the read your Bible and pray and go to church was what was going to bring happy and joy into my Christian journey. Um, through the period of the double mastectomies and the recovery, I couldn't pray. I, I Emotionally, physically, I found myself wanting to love Jesus the way I was told based on rules, um, and I couldn't. And so there was a lot of guilt, and there was a lot of anxiety about that. But God started showing me that that's why having people in our lives Church, um, going to church and having small groups and friends who are fellow believers, because when we are in situations where we can't, they can on our behalf, and they prayed me through. And so I healed from the surgery, and we um, continued to just live our life, very active in church. Um, I've been very involved in women's ministries through those years, did a little writing. Things were just kind of skating along at that point. And then we 
kept hearing these commercials about adoption and fostering, and James Dobson was doing this whole series on it, and the billboards, everywhere we looked was a billboard about being a foster parent or adopting kids, and, you know, I don't know how long my husband and I both were thinking about it before we said something, we were laying in bed one night, and I said something about the Dobson series, and he's like, Robin, I think God's telling us that we need to do this again, and I was like, well, I think the same thing. But we said never, and he was like, no, I I really believe God's calling us to do this. Well, I always wanted a big family, so I was all about it. And I knew that it had to be God, and we really felt like he was calling us at this point. Called the next day, got recertified, and our journey with foster care and adoption began. I have a joke with our Bible study group and also in Sunday school that the answer to every Bible study question is parenting, and that's been true in my life. Um, the thing I wanted more than anything in the world, to be a mama. It's also the thing that has caused more pain, but also has drove me to Jesus like nothing else. I was at work one afternoon, got a call for two little boys, babies, and that was not heard of. Nobody got babies into foster care. Um, They were 6 and 18 months, and I left work at 3.30 on a Thursday afternoon and went to the hospital ER to meet my boys. We had nothing. We had no plan. Um, Our church family just started flooding our living room with clothes and strollers and car seats, and um, Elijah and Isaiah came plummeting into our world like a meteor, and our world has never been the same since. We fostered for three years before our adoptions were final, and we thought the battle was won. We thought we had finally got to adoption and our family could move forward. And what we didn't know was the battle was just beginning. Um, Both of our boys were special needs adoptions, and we knew that. We just didn't understand exactly what all that meant. And our middle son um, was diagnosed with extreme RAD, which is reactive attachment disorder. Not sure if you're familiar with that. Google it. You'll find all kinds of information um, on that. But it rocked our world. And we spent our days just trying to love this child, love him, and to being able to accept a family, love him to be able to accept us. Brad, the disorder, is the inability to accept that love. And over the years, things progressed. There was a lot of abuse. There was a lot of violence. There were a lot of rages, multiple inpatient hospital stays for our son. And we just kept plugging along because we promised to love him and never leave him and that we would be his mom and dad. And so we just kept doing what we had done. It was ugly, and we didn't share that with everybody because we don't want people to think bad of him. And while we were plugging along day by day, begging God to heal our son. It was destroying our marriage. It was destroying our family. It was destroying our relationships. It was destroying my desire to serve God um, because I felt like God had tricked us. I felt like God had called me to obey, and I did. And the cost was way more than I was expecting. And then I felt alone, like he had left us to, to parent this child without any hope, without any guidance, without any strength. Our strength was gone. Um, And we just kept begging God to heal our son. And if not, he is still good. God did not heal our son. Things kept escalating and progressing, and we knew that things had to change. And I remember the day that one of the professionals that had worked with him said, Robin, somebody will end up dead if you don't make a change. And I remember face down in the carpet, just crying out before God. Ask him why. And asking him to do what I thought he needed to do so that our family could be whole again. But learning to trust that his ways are not our ways. And learning through parenting that I am in control of nothing. I have to trust that God's plan is better. And I have to know that he is good and he is faithful. And that means letting go. And that means learning to just pray for God's will and not my will. And so I became a praying mama like I had never prayed before. Like Hannah in the Bible when she's praying that, 
you know, for a son, and the priest thinks she's drunk with wine because she's just so devastated. She's like, no, I'm not drinking. I'm just sorrowful. And there's nothing like the prayer of a sorrowful, not just a woman, but anyone who's sorrowful, broken before God, and that's where God does his work. And sometimes that work isn't fixing our situation or fixing the person. Sometimes that work is making us look more like Jesus. It's changing us. And um, that's all I was saying recently. It's at first it hurts, and then it changes you. And that's kind of been my experience in my Christian walk. So much of what I've been through has hurt. It's hurt deep. But then it changes me. And I pray that it's changed me to look a little bit more like Jesus than I did before the situation came along. I don't like the situations. Nobody likes hard. Nobody likes the pain. Would I change it? I don't know, because at the end of the day, from that little girl who got saved in sixth grade, I only wanted to make Jesus proud. I wanted to serve him, and I wanted to point people to him. And, you know, the Bible doesn't say, well done, you fixer, you. You did a good job fixing that situation. And it doesn't say, well done, you persistent mama, you. He says, well done, good and faithful. I can't control so much. I can control whether or not I'm faithful to God. And that's my prayer, is that I will continue to be faithful. And people ask me often, how are you still standing? There's so much more to my testimony that just is almost unbelievable. Our friends have said, how much more? Or why, 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 (laughs) why do you keep believing when things keep happening? And it's because God loved me, and He died for me. And He said, I'll be with you. When you pass through the waters, they'll not overwhelm you. And when you pass through the fire, you won't be scorched. Has my heart been broken? Absolutely. But my God is faithful. And I know He's faithful because I stand, sit before you today, knowing that He has just provided in ways that are unbelievable. And I'll I'll leave you with this. I mentioned that my mom and dad divorced when I was very young, and I was a daddy's girl, always been a daddy's girl. And because of some of the teaching, I felt like maybe because of their divorce that maybe my daddy didn't really know the Lord like I thought he did, and I worried for years about my daddy. And he got sick a few years ago, and I stayed in his house while he was in the hospital, and I was looking at his Bible, and I... I went through the pages and I could see dates and times and highlights. And you know, many of those dates were after my mom and dad divorced. Some of them were very recent to the time that I was in this house. And I knew that we can't always look and judge people by their circumstances or their choices because their relationship with the Lord goes so much deeper than that. And I was so thankful to see my daddy's testimony in his Bible. And so we had always said, when my dad passed away, all I wanted was this Bible. And, you know, we have an aroma as believers. Um, The world knows us by our aroma. And I always wanted my aroma to be that of Jesus. My daddy was a smoker, and his Bible still smells of my dad and his smoking. He passed away last year. That's why I have his Bible right now. But the farther that this Bible is from my dad, his physical being, the less it smells like my daddy. And the farther we get from the Lord, if we go through situations that let us turn away from God instead of turn towards Him, that make us angry at Him for allowing it instead of trusting Him for what He's going to do through it, we smell a little bit less like Jesus. And I want people to smell the Rose of Sharon, the sweet aroma that Jesus gives us. And so I encourage you, no matter what you're going through, and we all go through stuff, and your stuff is different than my stuff, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt, and it doesn't discourage, and it can't cause you to wonder, did God trick me? Did He leave me here? Did He ask me to obey and then just say, okay, now you're on your own? He'll never do that. He is faithful, and even if it's not good, Even if the situation is not good, He is always good, and you can trust Him.